ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this third and final part of the Light Bite series on horticulture LED lighting. In this part, titled Growing Without Daylight, we will explain how implementing the perfect light conditions and controlling other climatic factors can take horticulture to another level, where daylight is no longer required for optimal plant growth. This part will be presented to you by Jasper den Besten and Roel Janssen. Welcome to the third webinar about light, the title Growing Without Daylight. My name is Jasper den Besten and I'm professor in New Cultivation Systems at Haas University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. I lecture plant physiology in general and focus on light and other cultivation conditions, mainly in situations without daylight, like in vertical or city farms. With a team of students and lecturers, Haas University started research in LED-equipped climate cells in 2009. At this moment, we also have cells in the Blue Innovation Center and in the Bright Box in the city of Venlo. A lot of research was done to optimize the number of kilograms per square meter per day and per mole per light. So far, the most important influencing factors were light, variety choice, and the root system. In this part, I will compare greenhouse and climate cell, so that the biggest differences become clear. The most important growth factor is light, with which I will start. Secondly, I will deal with the root environment. And finally, I will discuss the crop and variety choice. In the Netherlands, we have short days with limited light in winter, and long days with lots of light in summer. The country is located close to the North Sea, Atlantic Ocean, and the climate is highly influenced by the sea. Winters are mild and summers are not too warm, so that greenhouse production is possible year-round. In winter, however, the limited light makes winter production of tomato, cucumber and sweet peppers almost impossible. In the table, the y-axis indicates the time of the day, the x-axis shows the months over the year, and in each cell you can see the average light quantity in micromoles per square meter per second in the Netherlands. Cells are dark if it's dark, or if the light level is too low for a plant to produce sugars. The cells are red when the light level is so high that plants get problems with this amount of light. Photosynthesis slows down, completely stops, or the photosynthesis systems may even be damaged. In order to produce year-round, Growers install and use artificial light during the dark periods and to prevent light damage, they use screens during two light periods. Also during one day, we can have clear skies with lots of light next to heavy rain. Climate control in a greenhouse under these circumstances is not easy, of course. In a climate chamber, it can always be summer since the lights can be switched on any time. A big advantage is that plants can grow without stress. It's not too difficult to produce twice as much leafy vegetables as in greenhouses with the same or even a better taste. Maybe you thought it was strange that growing under artificial light goes better than under natural light, but apparently plants appreciate the quantity of light and the quality and the wavelength, the colors that we offer artificially better than the natural light. Compared to greenhouses, no light is scattered in the outside environment around a vertical farm, so neighbors or wildlife are not bothered. For the root environment, something similar occurs. In nature, plants grow with their roots in soil. They use the structure of the soil for root development, so that they stay upright and have access to water and nutrients. Our first trials in the climate cell were in pots with soil. The yield was impressive compared to greenhouse production, but when we changed to growing in rock wool, results were even better. This was probably due to the fact that the plants have better access to water and nutrients. Finally, we reduced the substrate quantity as much as possible and are working on a system with hardly any or even completely without any soil and substrate. The biggest challenge is to find a solution for the fact that without soil or substrates, Plants cannot anchor. Till that time, young plants will be raised in small pots and plugs. 
The material used can be diverse, like rock wool, cocoa peat, foam, and also soil. In general, the substrates can be divided into two groups. The first group contains organic material like soil or cocoa peat. The advantage of this type of substrate is that it holds quite some water and nutrients, and all crops grow on it. The disadvantage is that organic parts pollute systems that hold water, and openings can get clogged. The buffer in the system is relatively big, which also means that it's difficult to make changes in the available fertilizers. After germination and first growth, the pots and plugs can be transplanted into covers of systems with limited water, or for instance floating panels for systems with more water. The pots are fixed into the covers or panels, and plant root will leave the pot and grow into the water or moist air and take water and nutrients whenever they need it. This method is very suitable for plants that need some space, like lettuce, pak choy, herbs, and kale, but also for tomato and strawberry. Microgreens are grown in a high density, and the cultivation time is very short. When the products are being sold after a week or so, like in the case of broccoli cress and wheat grass cress, small containers with a layer of substrate are sufficient already. As stated before, the highest yields come from water systems like deep flow, nutrient film technique, and ebb and flow. Also systems with root sprinklers or mist, like aeroponics, are suitable as long as there are no technical problems. Systems with at least some water around the roots are more safe. In all systems with only or mainly water, plants can always take up enough water and enough nutrients. That probably is the most important explanation for the fast growth and high yields. Since the system is not only closed for light, but also for water and nutrients by means of water recirculation, the water use is only something like 10% of what is normal in greenhouses. Nutrients are used again and do not lead to eutrophication of natural water tables. A city farm has a multi-layer growing system. In order to have as many layers as possible, the layers are not too high. Tall crops, like most fruit vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, beans, cucumbers, simply do not fit into this system. Sometimes it's possible to grow a mini type, like a balcony tomato, however. The crop choice is therefore limited to lower crops, like microgreens, herbs, lettuce, and other leafy vegetables. Biologists divide the plant kingdom in groups called family, genus, and species. Often the relationship of plants is researched by looking carefully at the flower structure and crossability. Fragaria ananasa, for instance, is what we know as strawberry. Where the biologists stop subdividing, plant breeders start making varieties. From all crops we cultivate, there are within the same genus and species, several varieties. These varieties may differ in yield, color, taste, earliness, and other characteristics. Seeds of these varieties are often offered by big multinational companies like Monsanto, Syngenta, and Bayer. But there are also family-owned breeding companies and companies that specialize in organic seeds like CN Seeds, and many more companies. About the variety choice, we can be very short. For most crops, there has been no comparative research into the performance of different varieties yet, and so far plant breeders do not develop city farming varieties. We simply try and find the best field or greenhouse varieties, and try them in a vertical farm. Hello, and welcome to the second part of the presentation. My name is Ruhl Jensen. I'm the program manager city farming for Philips Horticulture Lead Solutions. I've been with the team since 2008 and after the introduction from Jasper, I will give you a bit more insight into the benefits of city farming. If you look at the benefits of city farming, they can be characterized into three main topics. One is yield, second is quality, third reliability. If you look at the yield, we can get much higher yield in a vertical farm than in conventional farming. More on that later. You can get shorter production cycles year-round. 
less waste in the value chain, and you can harvest on demand. If you look at quality, you can get improved plant quality and uniformity, optimized for taste, color, nutrient content, texture, and you won't have any strange particles in your crop. Then reliability, you have a controlled production cycle, therefore you have no pressure from disease or changes in your climate, you have no loss of CO2, no light pollution, and limited water usage because it's recycled. If you focus on the yield potential and you compare four different ways of farming, you can see the advantages for a vertical farm. In an open field, you typically grow in soil, have no heating and no artificial lighting. You get approximately 10 to 12 kilograms per square meter per year. If you look at a greenhouse, a more conventional greenhouse, which is already indoor, still grown in soil, there is heating but no artificial lighting, you could go up to 30 kilograms per square meter per year. If you look at a high-tech greenhouse, also indoor, hydroponics growing system, heating is available, and artificial light, either HPS or LED. You could go up to 60 kilograms per square meter per year. If you then look at a vertical farm, also indoor, also hydroponics, because of the energy that's released by both lighting and plants, you need cooling rather than heating. You use artificial lighting in the form of LEDs and you can produce 80 to 120 kilograms per square meter per year. Difference, however, is that this is a growing square meter. So if you would look at the cubic square meters, you would be able to produce much more. Because if we put in 10 layers of growth into a vertical farm, you would be able to achieve much higher yields, up to 800 or 1200 kilograms per square meter per year. And this is then a floor space square meter. To give you an example what that looks like, I have two pictures over here. One is in Osaka and one is in London. If you look at the waste reduction, there has been an article by the Global Food Losses and Food Waste from the Safe Food Initiative from 2011 that 46% of the food is lost across the whole value chain. 20% happens in agriculture, losses in the field, uh, damage from hailstorms, those kind of things. 4% post-harvest, 1% in processing, and 8% in distribution. If you look at indoor farming, it offers, offer, offers opportunities to reduce this waste. Firstly, you can harvest on demand. So if somebody needs to produce, you can exactly plan ahead to see that you harvest when it's needed. If they don't need it, you could also tune down the lights a bit and save another week or so. You have no flies, sand or risk of contamination from washing, washing the lettuce because it's clean and produced without soil in many cases. You have a change of texture to improve shelf life. So if somebody wants to have a pre-cut lettuce but it should have a good shelf life, you can find a unique growth recipe to increase that shelf life. And the last part, you can produce closer to the consumer. So the risk you have in your whole distribution and your logistic chain is basically gone because you can produce right where the consumer needs it. If you look at quality, you can really focus on plant quality and uniformity. You could basically put a, a measuring device above it and see that there is hardly any difference between the plants because they are completely uniform. This means it's very easy to pack and everything is really consolidated in a nice way. You look at quality, you can optimize for taste, color, nutrient content and harvest fresher and therefore eat healthier. So you could focus on nitrate, have it lower if there are certain restrictions from the retailer or have it higher if you have somebody who wants to run a marathon. You can focus on low potassium or high potassium. You can improve the glucosinolates, the flavonoids, the carotenoids and the vitamins. For example, basil, if you focus on light recipes for basil, 
you can increase the flavonoids which will then improve the flavor of the plant but also the taste and the oil content. If you look at the top two pictures you see two mustard leaves. What we've done over there is play around with a light recipe to increase the spiciness of the mustard. The one on the right is not only more colored but it's also much spicier. So based on customer need you can really produce what you want to. No strange particles and no need to wash in chlorine water. One of the biggest risk, risks for pr food processors is that there is a strange particle in their lettuce. It could be a simple thing like a, a bit of sand or a small bug, but it could also be a frog like you see in the two right pictures. And this is obviously something people don't want to have, especially with the power of social media nowadays. If you look at reliability, you have a controlled production cycle. So on day one you can say in 50 days I have my crop ready. If you want to speed that up you have the opportunity to do so. Next to that there is no pressure from disease or climate. Inside the cell you create overpressure and therefore you keep all the bugs out. Furthermore what you do is you reuse your water but you clean it by uh, passing it uh, through UV sterilization. The picture here is taken at the GrowEye Center in Eindhoven where you see a lot of technology is involved to keep that climate stable and to keep everything controlled. Because you do that you have no loss of CO2, obviously you don't have light pollution because you grow indoors and the water usage can be limited. We could use only one to two liters per kilogram of lettuce. If you think that it's the future, um, you might be surprised because it's already happening now. If you look at some of the projects listed over here, they are really selling their produce all across the globe. So Grow Up London is producing uh, on the edge of London and selling to all the restaurants and uh, specialty stores just around the corner. Green Sense Farms in the US is already offering their produce to all sorts of retailers in the area of Chicago. People in Ch Chicago don't want to have an old lettuce that's coming from Salinas and is in a truck for five days, but we prefer to have a local produced head of lettuce. That's what Green Sense Farms can offer them. The Philips Grow Eye Center is the research center for Philips based in Eindhoven on the High Tank campus. Everything that's produced over there and isn't destroyed for analysis is taken to all the restaurants at the campus. There is an Indian restaurant taking specialty herbs, there is an Italian restaurant taking basil and obviously there are a lot of self-service restaurants and even a Subway and Albert Heijn that could use the salads produced over there. Last but not least is Osaka Prefecture, a 1300 square meter facility where they produce mostly leafy greens, which they sell to supermarkets all around the facility there. So you see it's already there, and more information can be found online, also at the Association for Vertical Farming, or on the website philips.com slash cityfarm. Thank you for your attention, and don't hesitate to contact Jasper or myself for more questions. <laughs>